Hey there, wonderful listeners. Welcome back to the Stacey Chilomi Podcast at The Advisor, where we explore the world of health and wellness to empower you to live your best life. And today I'm thrilled to introduce my guest, Sander Vanth T, the founder of Moral Eats. And he has a podcast community on our site and he has his own podcast. So I suggest you check it out. Moral Eats is a revolutionary platform that is set in a new standard for ethical eating. With Moral Eats, you can let the meat you eat improve an animal's life. Sander and his team have correlated a range of meat boxes that allow you to increase the demand for ethically sourced animal products while enjoying delicious and nutritious dense meals. At Moral Eats, Sander's mission is to create a brighter, more, more positive future for farm animals. He believes that the true change starts with each and every one of us, but it grows into a moment where we join forces by choosing the lives of others and, and, and the farmlands and the farm animals. Increasing demand of ethically sourced products and advocating for human farming pra practices, Sander is transforming the food industry one bite at a time. So Sandra, I'm very excited to have you back on the show. Tell everybody a little about yourself and let's go right into the topic you wanted to talk about because I thought it was delightful when we spoke earlier, the different things you wanted to go over. Sure. Yeah, I'm a, a Dutch immigrant and we, my family always milked cows in Holland and then I immigrated to Canada and I grew up on, a, on our family's dairy farm. So that's basically my upbringing, lots of physical labor, lots of lessons learned on the, on the dairy farm. And I have always loved working with animals. So it was either going to be farming for me or veterinary medicine. And my parents always told me that if there was any doubt at all in my mind that I should pursue veterinary medicine because farming can be tough. So when you face those hard days, you don't want to have your mind filled with all the what ifs had I gone different down a different road. So I pursued veterinary medicine first. But once I had my application ready to apply to vet school, like I did my undergrad at the University of Guelph. And from there, you're supposed to apply to vet school. So I had my application ready. And I, and right around that time, that's when I realized that it wasn't for me, that I'd be able to work more with animals as a dairy farmer. So I came home to the family dairy farm in 2010 and I had all sorts of plans and ideas of how I was going to improve the farm and uh, improve the, the lives of these animals on our farm. But try as I might, there wasn't really a huge impact that I could make. I put all, poured all my effort and all my ideas, but I couldn't beat a poor environment. So I fought through that frustration for four or five years. And then 2015, we built our new dairy barns. And... I was ecstatic because the lies, like the 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 quality of our cows improved dramatically. They they really started to thrive in this new barn, which was centered around cow comfort. And that's has always been a passion of mine to 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 give our cows the best lives that I could. Um, you don't go into farming if you're not passionate about it for one reason or another. And for me, it was really about the animals. But at, around that time, my own health started to slip, which really was um, an inflection point in my life where I started changing a lot of my priorities and questioning a lot of my beliefs. I questioned the healthcare system and my own health choices, but I also questioned the way we farmed. And I was very much interested in finding ways of improving the welfare of our farm animals, give them an even better life, and kind of give back to these animals that brought so much joy to my life. And that led me to things like regenerative agriculture, but it also brought me to question a lot of the, of the long-held beliefs that I had about how we dairy farmed, including uh, why we remove the calf from the mother. And I, I realized that I always believed that it, it must be done, it had to be done, but that it wasn't really my belief. It was a belief that I adopted just from growing up on a dairy farm and listening to all the different advisors on uh, in the dairy industry, the veterinarians and the, the the nutritionists and educators and stuff like that, and that I've never had any true firsthand exper experience with leaving them together. All I knew was that it was strongly advised to remove them as quick as possible, and that some people have tried keeping them together and failed miserably. That yeah. was the extent of my knowledge. So years ago, I, I decided I would just 
try a couple of, of uh, bull calves and leave them in our fresh cow pack. We have a, a pack area, which is lots of deep, deep bedding of, of straw and sawdust. And we keep our fresh cows there for on average a week before they go out to our main herd is they got a little secluded area where it's more quiet. We can keep a closer eye on these animals right. when they're going through a very difficult transition from being of not producing milk to having a calf and then producing milk. So we had this secluded area. So I, I just put a couple of bull calves there and I don't know what I was expecting. Um, I, I thought they might like self-destruct or something like that. Like it was, it, you have to understand how deeply ingrained these beliefs are. Yeah. So to my surprise, these calves, they did really, really well. They stayed healthy. They grew incredibly well because they could drink all the milk they wanted. And it was very hands off on my part. Um, it didn't take a lot of work, a lot of labor because the cow fed the calf. And mm -hmm. at that moment, I was addicted. Like all my beliefs got shattered. And I, from that point on, I was dedicated to finding a way to make this possible at scale. Um, mm -hmm not just on a small little hobby farms or for one or two cats here or there, but like across our whole dairy farm, I was hooked and I, I was determined to make it work. And around that time too, um, I, I was doing a lot of learning about, about health and stuff like that, but also just listening to other business folks. And one of the concepts that was, uh, that struck a chord with me was popularized by Elon Musk. And that is to think in first principles, so if I look at what it takes to raise calves, healthy calves, the, the the first principles are what are called the five C's of calf care. And that is they need to have colostrum as soon as possible after birth because that's where all their antibodies, all their immune system is built through that colostrum. They don't receive any immunity through the placenta. Okay. So that colostrum is critical for having healthy calves and uh, for, for several months of, of their lives so then so the classroom is important they need to have enough calories to grow they need to have, mostly in the form of milk for the first two months but later on as they move to grains or forages they need to have high quality feed lots of calories they need consistency consistency is critical for cows and calves yes you, they've been shown like if you if you change the timing of their feeding so it's kind of on a random schedule even if the calories are kept the same just the fact that it's inconsistent, you have decreased growth. So yeah. the, the consistency is very, very important. And then also the environment, it needs to be clean. The sanitation, you can't have a, a huge amount of pathogenic bacteria in the environment because then the cats will get sick. Right. And then, and then it, is, it needs to be comfortable. So those are the five C's. And nowhere in there does it say that the cats have to be removed from their mother. So that's what made me believe like it has to be possible. If you look at what it actually takes to re raise a healthy calf, right. it has to be possible. It's just difficult and we haven't figured it out yet. Right. So luckily, like over the years, just for the sake of farming, farms handling calves, there has been a trend towards moving the calves indoors, not for the calf's sake again, but for the farmer's sake. Right. There's actually, the gold standard for healthy calves is the calf hutches, which is centered around a lot of controversy. A lot of people don't like these calf hutches, but that's the gold standard for healthy calves. There's no system that gives you healthier calves than putting them inside a calf hutch. But people have been trying to get close to it with housing them in a barn in group, housing them in groups and designing all sorts of special ventilations, ventilation right. systems and lighting and automation. And they've gotten close. Um, they usually might have like a wave of, of, of a cold, during the fall or spring, and then like some, some pneumonia that comes along with that, but they've gotten pretty close. Like the the housing, um, the technologies and the knowledge around housing these cats has improved dramatically over the years. So, my thought was like, what if we take that knowledge and we apply it to our fresh cow area? So an area where the cows are just after calving, and you ventilate it and you manage it similar to a calf barn. Right. So the cows are fine because they don't they don't they don't have the same requirements that a baby calf does, but then right. the calf can still thrive and be together with the mother. So that's what I'm, I've been working towards for years now. Um probably 
four or five years, just working, taking the little steps and trying to make little improvements and, and pushing the system farther, stressing it to see if it'll fall, break apart. And, and I've been, I've been continuously surprised by how well the system can work in, in an ideal, in an ideal barn in an ideal environment and with proper management. I think it's so important because, you know, when I had read the book, vegan versus vegetarian, and I saw what the American food industry was doing to their cows. Um, it was very disturbing because they, you know, people don't realize it, but they are, the, you know, they are farm, you know, dairy farmers like you who do it the right way. But they are people out there that are, you know, um, producing milk, but they're they're putting all these calves and cows in one confined area to the point where they they squash them so so closely together that their hoofs were being deformed and they actually when one cow would get sick they would inter, inter, interject all the cows with antibiotics and then they would even put hormones into the into the cows and you know to make the the cows bigger and produce more milk and then people noticed that, you know, it was, it was changing the composition of people's bodies and people were actually young children were going through menstruation at an early age. People's bodies were changing because of the hormones that these dairy farmers were in the, in America were, were putting in, into their cows. And, you know, I think also, you know, that maybe, you know, I don't know for sure, but, you know, maybe some of this lactose intolerance that so many people in America suffer from is the way they, they treat these animals and the way, you know, the things that they do to these animals, it, it's hurting human beings and, and their bodies. And I think it's so good that, you know, farmers, you know, dairy farmers like you are doing it the right way, because I think it makes such an impact on a person's health. If, if only everybody could, you know, farm, you know, uh, and produce cow's milk the way you do, I think it would, it would, it would change and improve people's health tremendously. What do you think? It would absolutely. And like, like, cause, and, and like the dairy industry is constantly improving. Like our, our own dairy farm has improved dramatically over the years. And we've seen that firsthand to how much of an impact that can make on the health of the animal and like, and healthy animals produce healthy milk, healthy meat everything um but like because like like if people have done all sorts of horrible things in the name of profits in the past like it, like some of those original um dairy farms that in the 1980s that were in the middle of the city next to a brewery that were fed nothing but the broad products of a brew of that brewery and those animals were horribly unhealthy and, and dark and dirty like they're horrible horrible conditions but like a lot like the, the dairy industry and agriculture as a whole animal agriculture is constantly improving. And the, the, the joy of like working with these animals, especially with cattle is like the better you treat them, the more profitable you are. So like, yeah. it's a very rewarding business to be in, in that way. So like, so because of that congruency, because of like the, the fact that the cat wins and the farmer wins, yeah, commercial agriculture has improved dramatically over the years. So yeah. like what you might see in a lot of these horror films and stuff like that, it a lot of that is is old footage and and the and the things aren't done that way anymore. Like I know even in the States, like in Canada, the those hormones that were used to increase production, those 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 hormones were never legal in Canada, but I don't, even right. in the States, there's a lot of processors that won't even accept milk that are produced in that way anymore. So like Things are constantly improving and 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 um and and getting better in that way and but like well with the way we do it we're trying to i'm trying to be on that leading edge especially yeah. from the welfare perspective and like really be that example for the industry and and show that there's interest in these products there's interest in in from the consumer's point of view but also that it's physically possible to do some of these management practices and still have the calf thrive because yeah. like the calf needs to do well. Cause if I keep them together and the calf is sick, it's no longer an improvement in welfare. It's just branding that right. I'm doing for the sake of, of, of making the consumer happy. Like it has to be in the best interest of the animal 
And that's the reason why they are typically removed and why I am actually not against the typical farmer, dairy farmer, removing the calf because like the calves, they do well when they're separated. And like it's it's kind of counterintuitive from our perspective because we're not cows. Yeah. And we need to remember is that like the the way that cows naturally parent or raise their calf is very similar to deer in that okay. they're hiders. So what they would do is the cow have a calf. And then they'll clean up, they'll eat the placenta, they'll clean up the calf. There's no much, there's not much of a scent. And then they'll hide that calf in the bushes somewhere. And then the cow will go out and graze. Oh. And then as the calf gets a little bit older, maybe they'll form little calf groups, little, little calf kindergartens. <laughs> and then there might be one cow that kind of hangs out with this group of calves while the rest go out and graze. But the, at the start, they're, they're just relying on hiding the calf and hoping that the predator does not find them. Right that's what deer do as well. So like it's, it's natural for the calf to kind of stay, sit isolated and, and wait for the mom to come back to have, be fed. And then for the mom to leave again at the, at the start. It's like, that's why, that's why the cats seem to do so well in the, the modern system. Okay. And, but, but with that being said, like I, I want people to understand where the industry is coming from, but yeah. with that being said, the way I like to measure animal welfare is by seeing how well the animal can express their natural behaviors. And unfortunately in dairy cows, especially we don't allow these dairy cows to express their natural maternal behaviors. Wow. And it's a real beautiful thing to watch. And it's not, it's, it's heartwarming. And then the cows, they, they really do enjoy. Um, and uh, well, it's not surprising of course, but like they, they love taking care of their babies. So, and like, and so it's really, I, I love watching it and, and uh, it's a beautiful thing to see, but like, uh, and, and one of the reasons why people cite against keeping them together is especially dairy cows. We have Holsteins and they're notorious for having horrible maternal instincts mm -hmm. and it's true, but a beautiful thing happens when you allow them to stay together despite that. And that is the calf starts to cycle on the mom. The mom releases oxytocin. Oxytocin is the bonding hormone. And through that drinking process and through those hormones, they form that they form a maternal bond with the calf. And that cow, even first, the very, very first time they have their very first calf, and they're completely oblivious of what they need to do, that animal transforms into a very attentive and very caring mother. So, and like it's different animals take a lot. Like there's not consistent amongst all animals, but every single animal I've seen has the capacity to become a great mother and take care of their own calf. So, like, once you allow them to suckle, that is no longer an argument against keeping them together. In my experience, the real reason why they need to be separated typically mm -hmm. is for the health of the calf. Okay. The the during the the calving period and like the mom is stressed, they start to expel all sorts of bacteria and stuff like that. So there's a there's a large bacteria load, mm -hmm. and also the air quality. the The quality of the air is different. The the loss of bacteria and stuff like that is all spread through the air, and then the calf is very susceptible to things like pneumonia. So those are some of the things that I've been addressing head on to try mm -hmm. to improve to to show how I can do this and prove to myself and like, and, and then uh, to how we can do this once we scale it up. So the scouring, what I've done is to, to combat that disease pressure in the environment, to keep that environment clean as per those five C's of cow, cow, uh, cow manage, calf management of ha raising healthy calves, the cleanliness for the environment. I've been managing that by doing, I, I compost the pack area. So mm -hmm. twice a day we go through with a cultivator or a chisel plow and we, we pull the, uh, the compost uh, up and into the air and we throw it around and yes. we introduce air, to the compost. So that when you're constantly aerating this pack, it's composting instead of rotting. And you have mm -hmm. a very different group of bacteria growing there. They're aerobic bacteria, they're healthy bacteria. A lot of the disease causing the pathogenic bacteria are anaerobic. They, in, they thrive in an environment without 
oxygen. So you have, you're, you're growing a lot of these healthier bacteria that don't cause the scours, that, that also don't cause mastitis. It's right. a growing trend to raise dairy cows on these compost packs because if you have them on a regular pack, you have all sorts of mastitis, all sorts of trouble. But if you compost it and you get that, you get the introduce that air and, and the temperature increases in this compost pack, you can raise, you can have your dairy cows on this compost pack without getting mastitis which is kind of a proof of concept that composting yeah. makes a big difference so i do that to prevent scours in the calves to prevent the the disease pressure of these scour these um these diarrhea causing bacteria in the environment which has worked really really well and then but like the pneumonia is is more difficult to tackle mm. so one of the things that i do especially once it starts like the the spring and fall and yeah all winter when it's really cold, but those spring and falls when the calves are very sensitive with the fluctuations in temperatures. Yeah. I I, I put coats on the calves really early on. Mm -hmm. And at first I was kind of worried that the, the mom would come and just like lick it and bite it and rip it off. Yeah. But yeah. Most part, the mom's done a pretty good job leaving the coats alone. And that coat keeps the calf warmer, but more importantly, it protects the calf from the drafts, the downward falling air, the cold air. In, the, in this larger barn that also fits the cows. So the the coats have made a big difference, but to really do this properly, you, you have to set up the ventilation system similar to a calf barn. And we do this in our, the heifers, once they're weaned, they go into a larger barn with older heifers, which also leaves these younger heifers vulnerable to getting sick from, what, from the, the disease pressure from the older heifers. So we put in tubes, and then you, we, with a fan, you push air into these tubes with all the little holes in it that oh, wow. spread fresh air through the whole length of the area where the calves are. So it's, it's a positive pressure system. So you're pushing fresh, clean air right where the calves need it. So that's what I would do once I build a barn for all of my cows and all of my calves to, to be able to manage all of them in this way, not just this the, the test groups that I'm doing right now in our fresh cow area, I would put in these positive pressure air tubes to really have the same success with these calves that you would have in a calf barn. And, and that would basically is like the last straw of, of why you shouldn't keep them together. So like, I think it's possible not only on a small scale, but on a large scale by managing it in this way. Wow. It's funny because I drove by a farm yesterday and they, the animals had coats on them while, while they were roaming in the pastures. It was, uh, and I noticed that and I was like, oh, wow, they're wearing coats. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cute to see. It is very cute to see. It was really cute. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, it's really pleasing to know that, you know, that our industry in our dairy industry, there has been a lot of positive changes, you know, uh, because I was worried because from what I read in that one book, it kind of scared me because in America, our food industry is a little bit more commercialized where they look more on profits sometimes and they do on, on actually helping people. But it's good to know that there are people like you who are making positive changes and that it has become a cycle in our society to help people and make differences. Yes. I'm, you know, it's very good to know because like things have changed so much in our society. Um, but, you know, I had read that book years ago and so it worried, you know, I didn't, until I met you, I didn't realize how much of a change that society is actually made to help improve the dairy industry because it, it's, you know, it was always scary because, you know, you, you, there was for a while, there was a lot, of, a lot of negativeness about dairy in the United States. So it's good to know that, you know, that the dairy industry is actually improving and making changes to improve people's health and to improve the product so it doesn't affect people in a negative way and that they're actually taking care of the animals the way they're supposed to take care of the animals because a healthy animal is going to make a healthy product, which is going to in turn help people with their health as well. And
And it's very interesting how you, you know, you talk about how, how you care for the animals and how you, the whole process of the uh, dairy industry and how everything is done, you know, behind, you know, closed doors. Cause you don't really realize everything, all the energy and all the things that get put into it when, you know, from, if you're not familiarized with the food industry and the dairy industry itself. But it seems like you go through a lot of different stages to help protect the animals. And so the animals, you know, can live a, a healthy life and also produce a healthy product as well. Absolutely. And there's, there's a lot of challenges. Like, and, and like, I've spent a lot of time talking already just like on the health of the calves. But like, even say like you, you manage to keep the calves healthy. And I, there's also welfare concerns with keeping the cows and calves together. And one of those... Well, one of them is unwarranted. A lot, of, a lot of people are worried, like, oh, the cow is going to lay on top of the calf yeah. and crush the calves, which, like, those tragedies do happen on dairy farms and, well, any farm, but they always happen when the calf is freshly born and not comfortable on its feet. It's not able to get up and move. Okay. That always happens in those first few hours of life, basically. That's when the highest risk, when the calf is not quite mobile yet they they start to walk around like a half an hour to an hour after birth oh, but okay. once they're they're strong and and they're capable calves there's basically these calves are strong and they're very coordinated because they're in this environment this social environment with their with these cows so they're very coordinated too there's, there's a huge difference between uh the uh, the calves that have that are raised with their mothers versus the ones that are still in these calf hutches that i'm comparing them to yeah there's a huge difference coordination and strength but because of that there's really no risk of of the cow crushing the baby at that point it's just in the first few hours of life which happens regardless if you remove the calf from their mother so that risk doesn't go away if you remove them but one of the other welfare concerns is once you allow the cow and calf to form that maternal bond and they have this really strong connection the weaning process becomes more stressful. So typically okay. what happens is that during the weaning process, you slowly decrease their, the milk that they get and, they, and then the calf slowly increases the, the, the forages and the grain intake to the point where the calf no longer needs the milk and then they can just eat the typical forages and stuff like that. Right. So that's the, and you, you do that gradually because if you do it too quick, the calf is more stressed and around that same time, they're moved to other barns, more stress. The, the the immunity from the colostrum only lasts about three months. So then that's starting to decrease. And then the calf is just overly vulnerable to getting sick. So usually yeah. when, you, when you have a highly stressed process where you, you're weaning them too quickly, too dramatically, there's so much stress that the calf has a way higher chance of getting sick, especially from pneumonia. Right. So you have to make that process gradual and as stress-free as possible. The more gradual, the better, so the calf doesn't feel that stress and doesn't become extra vulnerable to getting sick. So like it's something that we do already with like the the calves and the calf hutches, but then but the, you have the extra step when they're raised by their mothers because they also need to wean off of their mothers. Right. It's like a, it's a double weaning process. Yeah. And how do you do that? How do you gradually decrease milk production when you're not the one feeding the calf? The mom is. Right. And so then he's like, oh, you got to take the calf, separate the calf. But then you're, you're, then you're doing that quick weaning from their mother. So they, it's, it's really challenging. And I haven't found very many people that found a satisfactory solution to that. I found right. one accidentally. So I have, there's a, there's a, a creep feeder is what it's called, but there's a little corner pen inside the fresh cow pack where just the calves can get in and the right. mother's it's too small of an opening and mm -hmm. the calves go in there they, they, they have their own water and stuff like that and their own little feed. And then they can come back out and join the mom. And there's lots of behaviors that, that change as the calves age like they they do form these little calf kindergartens and they like to hang out just themselves just these just the baby calves and yeah. they're quite often they'll hang out in this in this creep feeder away from the mothers and then some of the mothers will actually like hang out there and call to them to come out because <laughs> they're not they can't get to them but uh the calf was, the calves will hang out in this creep feeder sometimes and i find that the older they get the more time they spend separate from their mothers okay but 
And then, uh, and then at the weaning, what I did is I, I closed the gate and the cats couldn't leave this creep feeder anymore. So it became a weaning pen where the <laughs> cows can still reach over and they can still um, like look at them, see each other, but they couldn't get right up next to them anymore. There, there was a gate in between. Okay. But this gate had openings. And my intention was I'm going to go feed milk in this creep feeder and the calf will drink the milk and I'll slowly decrease the milk and then they'll still be next to the mom. Right. That was my intention, but it didn't work. The cat didn't want to drink milk. They only wanted to drink the milk from their mother. They'd rather go hungry than drink the milk that I gave them. Wow. But because the cats became upset because they didn't want to drink the milk and they wanted milk and they wanted their mothers, they became upset. Then the cows responded and stood up next to them. They stood up next to the gate. So then the, the mom still fed the calf. The, and like and not all the mothers would do this, just the ones that are like a, have a, a really the really maternal ones would. And they would yeah. stand next to them. The calves would line up on the fence and drink from the mothers. And I was doing some research about it. And in the beef industry, sometimes they do this on purpose and they call it fence line weaning. <laughs> so I I uh, over time I was like. The, the problem was like that when that happens, it's it's amazing because the mom naturally is becoming disinterested in the calf wow. already. And so like at the start, at the start, when the calf is first born, the mom initiates a lot of the contacts between the calf and the cow. Yeah. And then later on, it's the calf that's initiating a lot of the contacts. It's the calf coming up to the mom. And then the mom naturally becomes more disinterested over time as as the months progress mm -hmm. and the calf maintains that that relationship as wow. they age so the cow is already like some of them are, are ready just to take off and leave the calf alone and the wow. calf still wants some and it's a calf that get upset but then there's other ones it's not consistent is it's a problem and like i was saying another one of the seeds to making a calf thrive is consistency right. so i ended up doing is i ended up putting a second gate next to the gate where the calves were and i would and i would keep the cow next to the the weaning pen on purpose so i'd chase a cow in there i close i like i push the cow next to the weaning pen and then i i could personally manage how often the moms feed the calves in the weaning pen oh wow so they would they would still have that contact and then i would manage i would make sure even the ones that were had lower maternal instincts would still come up and I would, and I would keep them there with his gate for five, 10 minutes. The calves would drink, then I can open the gate and the mom would leave. <laughs> and then start off maybe three or four times a day. I'd put the cows there and then, and then twice a day and then once a day. And then I would, I, and then like over time, maybe I would milk out the calf half in the robots and then I'd yeah. bring the cow over. And that's the way I was able to gradually wean the calf off the milk while <laughs> keeping the cow next to the calf. So then, and then like, so that, that solved one of the major issues that I was having is, is, is how do I gradually wean the milk? Cause you might yeah. just say, oh, just wait them for half a day. And a lot of people do this, but all that happens, the calf refuses to drink from the bottle or from the bucket. Like I tried and right. they'll slug feed for the half day that they are with the mothers and they won't drink any less. So you're still not gradually weaning them off of the milk. Right. And then like a, the cow is already naturally starting to become less interested in the calf. The calf is not hungry. Mm -hmm. it's slowly weaned off the milk and it's slowly increasing the solid intake. And then the, so the mom, and then like the, so like the separation happens, like the, the, the social separation happens naturally yeah. without me even trying. So, uh, so then that way I was able to have this stress-free weaning process and solve one of the major welfare issues with, keeping them together so yeah this right now i feel like the main roadblock is getting to the point where i can scale this up and prove that it works right wow that's so cool that really is cool now with so many different milks on our shelves like you go into into food stores especially in america and there are so many different types of milks and you got different flavors now and they you know you have so many different brands what should a consumer look for if they want to have a really healthy milk for you know what what type of milk is the best milk like from your suggestion like what sh what should people look out for as a consumer it's a little controversial in the industry, but I feel like the, the if you're going to the supermarket, the best milk you can find, if you're lucky enough to be able to get it, is raw milk. 
-hmm. that is above everything else i think the best milk product that you can get it's it's a very healthy very unique product that that like and and pasteurized milk is a, a nutritional powerhouse as well but it's just it doesn't compare to raw milk because a lot of the nutrients become um, either denatured or the mm -hmm. enzymes that help with their absorption become denatured and okay. they're no longer functional. So you don't get the same nutrition as you do in raw milk. That being said, like pasteurized milk is still amazing. It's just that once you pasteurize it, those you have less nutrition. And also all of a sudden it becomes one of the nine most triggering uh, algae triggering foods that, mm -hmm. that, uh, in, that you can eat. So that and that's based off of the F, the FDA. It's of course pasteurized milk is the one of the nine most allergenic foods. So like that is not the case with raw milk. I personally have issues with with drinking or consuming dairy products, but I have none at all. No allergy response at all, or no discomfort when I drink raw milk. Right, and I can drink leaf stuff without issues. So it is a very different product, especially for people that are sensitive to it for allergic reasons or autoimmunity and stuff like that. So like that, I think it's the, in my opinion, the gold standard. Um, beyond that, you can do things like grass fed milk, hundred percent grass fed milk, which might improve the, the fatty acid profiles in the milk. And especially mm -hmm. if they're rotationally grazing their dairy cows and doing yeah. it in a regenerative way you can have improved nutrient density but it won't be as dramatic of a change as going from pasteurized to raw yeah. and people like like the, there's things like a2 milk and stuff like that too but like once you have raw milk the a1 and a2 the 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 the, the casein molecules it doesn't cause issues anymore it doesn't matter yeah. if it's a1 or two if it's raw it's like so then like if you, but if you can't get that raw milk, A2 milk can be less allergenic than regular milk. So that can be an improvement if you have that. Either A, it's been tested to be from 100% A2, A2 cows, or it could be from some of these heritage breeds that yeah. only produce two type of proteins. And then, um, like, yeah, there's lots, lots, every brand will tout the benefits of their particular brands, but, and, and classifications and, and stuff like that. But I feel like the next best thing is if you can, is, is to source it directly from a farmer because a lot of these labels get hijacked. Yeah. Even like grass fed a hundred percent, it can be a hundred percent grass fed, but what if they're fed nothing but grass pellets and, and they're still in confined housing. They're not out in the environment. They're not rotationally grazed. Like, right. But legally, they can still call it rotationally grazed. And there's rules that you can follow too. Like they have to be outside for this many hours. Well, you can do that on an exercise lot. And in fact, that's what happens usually in the winter months on a lot of these farms. So like a lot, of, like I, I'm personally not a huge fan of all these certifications and all these labels because unfortunately it can always be, it can always be hijacked to mean something that it's not. For yes. example, um, I came across that if you actually test the foods that are labeled as vegan mm -hmm. of all things, I think it was 29 or 39 percent of them actually contain traces of contain trace amounts of dairy and eggs. Mm -hmm. So like it's it's just a matter of definition. What is 100 percent vegan? What yeah. is organic? What is 100% grass fed? Like, and once you have those rules set that you're enforcing, people will find a way to, to find like all the the little gray areas in the rules, so they right. can still can still be classified as that product, and 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 not really raise it or produce it in a way that was meant when the when they initially started the certification. So the best thing is to build a relationship with a farmer, shake their hands, get to know how they produce their food. Right. And make sure the way that you approve. And that I think is is the best way to consume dairy, yes, but just food in general. Right. Oh, I agree with you. I, I think um there is a lot of exaggeration on a lot of these these labelized um products that we uh we see in stores. Um 
and that you don't have to, you can follow the rules, you know, to, and, but it doesn't mean it's exactly, you know, what it, it you know, it's claiming. Cause it, it, you know, you could have like, for instance, like for some, for some of the products, it said uh, in the United States, no added hormones. So that means they have hormones in it. They just didn't add additional hormones. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, that's just an example. Like, and like you said, you know, you, you can, they can have like, you know, be outside for a certain amount of hours. It doesn't necessarily mean one thing, you know, and you see a lot of that, you know, so it, it seems like the best way is, is to look for a raw milk or to look, you know, or if you are, if you're close to a farm, to try to get to know the farmer and try to get, you know, really, and it seems like you should pr probably try to stay away from the pasteurized milks also, right? That's, you know, another thing you, you said, try to stay more towards the raw milk, or you said more the, the more naturalized milk, you know, and stay with the, the, uh, the commercialized uh, products that they sell in the stores, correct? That's right. Yeah. If you're able to get it, the raw, the raw stuff is definitely, in my opinion, far superior. Um, and it's a completely separate product. But like, with that being said, like even pasteurized milk is still a nutritional powerhouse. It's still a complete food. It's still a great product. It's just not comparable, in my opinion. Right. And is there a difference really when they say whole milk, they say, you know, um, low fat milk, skim milk, you know, is there really a difference between the three? Is one better than the other? Like, or is one really, you know, what's your, your intake on, on that? When you see that, in the, you see that all the time in the stores, they give you the three to choose from, you know, what's your, your, your thoughts about the, the, the you know, whole milk and low fat milk and, and skim milk? Yeah, they, it was meant to, milk was meant to be consumed with the high fat content. Like there's, there's the fat is in that milk for a reason. And if you actually look at human breast milk, it is much higher in fat than dairy milk is. So like that fat is critical. And it's one of the major blunders, in my opinion, with food labeling and food recommendations in the past 70 years is this trend towards low fat and yeah. then lower calories. Like, yes, there's technically less calories if you're drinking 1% or the skim milk, but it's also less satiating and your body is craving those fats. And, 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 it, and it's not just the the saturated fats and the, and the healthy fats in the, the dairy products or any other product for that matter. There's a lot of nutrition that require fats to be absorbed yeah they're actually only found in the fats there's a lot of fat soluble vitamins that you can only find in the fat and arguably those are some of the most critical nutrients for our health that you need those fats and i know i've tried all sorts of different diets with different fat contents and different contents of like different portions of animal products like doesn't matter who you listen to basically everybody says you should eat whole foods but then once you do that do you eat 100 percent plant-based or do you do you or, or do you go 100 percent carnivore where do you fall what sh what's the ideal diet and uh, um ultimately people need to try for themselves and i think they should try for themselves to see yeah. what their body actually tells them but um i was blown away and like when you learn learn to like get in tune with your body and what your body wants. And uh, one of the things that I noticed is that when I was eating a relatively low fat, and with that being said, I had the caveat that I was really putting a lot of emphasis on trying to eat as much plant-based fats at that time. I was adding avocados and seeds and nuts to every single meal I ate and a lot of it because I need a lot of calories. I have a, an active lifestyle. Yeah. So I was eating lots of these healthy fats that, but nothing from animal products at that time to, right. to because at that time that was what was considered the healthiest diet and I was struggling with my own health conditions. So right. I was desperate to get healthy. I was willing to try anything. But in that time, I could be full and stuffed and I could have these massive meals and I would still have cravings afterwards. Like I, I always, and one craving in particular that I could never shake was the craving for chocolate. I drank, or I, I consumed 95% dark chocolate because that's the healthiest chocolate mm -hmm. with all the antioxidants and everything else in there they talk about. But like, but I could never get enough of it. And I realized after the fact that chocolate is one of maybe two plant-sourced sources of saturated fats. And uh. So like 
you need those saturated fats. You're, you're and like and cholesterol as well is also demonized, but wrongly so. Like your brain is 20% cholesterol, 60% fat. Every hormone is based off of cholesterol and fats. Like you need those building blocks to to create those those hormones. Right. And like it's like every cell membrane of your of your of your body is made with fats, saturated fats and cholesterols. Yeah. So it's like and and every organelle within those cells are also made with those those saturated fats and cholesterol. Like you need it. And like my body was definitely craving it. I realized now after the fact because like now I, I experimented all the way to hundred percent meat and I backed off back towards where I felt or I personally felt best, right. which is still a surprising amount of meat and animal products, but all whole food sources. Mm. And um, one of the, the great things is that like I can have chocolate now in my cupboard and it will sit there for months and I won't touch it because I don't crave it. Mm. So it's like, I was always this chocolate fiend. I can never get enough. And now like there's no, there's really no cravings and it's, it's, it's a unique experience that you should, hopefully everybody can have a chance to experience themselves but like their body is just happy and satisfied yeah. and like your health and you have lots of vitality lots of energy lots of strength and um and for me i think like maybe one of the reasons why i feel so good is like like is like the nutrient density of the food yes but all whole foods are quite nutrient dense as a whole but also the digestibility like you actually get the nutrition that you uh, that is labeled on that food that you research and say, oh, there's so much of this good stuff in there. You actually yeah. get it, you get it from animal sources. Right. So, uh, so you you're it's so digestible, and it's so it's also in the form that your body already needs. Yeah. You don't have to change it from like from uh, keratin to vitamin A. Like it's already vitamin A. Like yeah. it's it's, and they say yeah, you if you eat enough of it, you can you you still have enough of those vitamins like the vitamin a but there is a significant portion of the population that can't even make that conversion yeah. and that's just for one nutrient let alone all the different nutrients that your body wants and needs that are essential but like i want to take a moment just to emphasize some of the non-essential nutrients that mm -hmm. you can find in animal products like the the one that's like most researched is creatine and it's it's been shown pretty conclusively that it dramatically increases your energy levels your strength levels and your mental clarity your focus yeah so like by 10 20 percent significant amounts and most people that especially athletes but most people that do take creatine for one reason or another they supplement with creatine but if you're eating a significant amount of animal products uh, like i am i eat well i usually eat at least two pounds of of meat a day sometimes more and and then dairy products as well but like when you eat that much, which sounds insane, believe me, I know, but when you eat that much, you actually are getting the amount of creatine that you pe these people are supplementing with to get yeah. these benefits, these energy and these strength benefits. And that's just one of these amino acids that are not essential, but yeah. obviously when you eat more of it, you perform more optimally. That's like, I don't think that's controversial. That's yeah. in the science that it's, it's, creatine is one of the most heavily studied substances for a long period of time too. It's like, there's no side effects from taking this creatine, but that's just one of these amino acids that you can find exclusively in animal products, especially red meat that has been shown to have this massive benefit, but there's so many more like the taurine and carnosine and carnitine. Like there's, there, that all have immunological benefits that have um, anti-inflammatory benefits or energy or longevity benefits right. that yes, your body can make them, but you're not, going to make the optimal amount unless you're right. consuming a large amount of it and then and then so like yes yeah, like you, you you don't need it to live but you need it to thrive yes for sure a hundred percent now if you had to take everything that we talked about today and emphasize some takeaways what are some things that you really like to get across to our listeners from today's conversation I feel like uh, the message that I always like to come back to is to vote with your food dollars. Mm -hmm. There are differences and in, in products and, and the way animals are raised. There's always those bad apples in there yeah. that, that paint the industry negatively and rightfully so. 
but there's also farmers that are like the average farmer are, is, is great and they're conscientious and doing things the way it should be done. But there's also other ones that are on this leading edge, like what we're trying to do with more leads and with improving animal welfare and promoting regenerative agriculture. And right. like, there's lots of farmers around too. And like, if, if you manage to find one of those or, or one of those are local to you and you support that, then that is a, a, something that can grow you. You the most powerful way to have a positive impact on agriculture is with through supply and demand and by yeah. finding those farmers and supporting them so that that way of agriculture can grow and and it's not just like a niche product anymore it, it can it can become the norm yeah. so that's done through voting with your food dollars or your conscientious food dollars and putting them in places where you feel you would like agriculture to move right a hundred percent a hundred percent. Now, where can people find your products and where can people find more information about you? I'm on social media and uh, and, and on podcasts like yours uh, so that people can find me there as well. But um, our favorite way to connect is through email because I don't have to rely on a social media platform to put my content in front of people. It's like I have their direct um, contact information and that email goes into their inbox and they either have to delete it or read it mm -hmm. and and I know they at least I know they got it so yes. like, that's my favorite way to connect it's the most reliable way for me to connect so and, and people that live in Ontario when they sign up to our email list they actually are entered to win a free meat box and have the opportunity of trying our product for free but that's just in Ontario um, outside of Ontario then um, uh, we hope to grow eventually but like outside of Ontario, social media, we have, we're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. Um, TikTok is where people seem to find uh, we have the biggest following. But like uh, we create a lot, of I create a lot of short videos, mm -hmm. and that's I've had the most success with. Um, so on TikTok, um, it's Sander Advanced D, and on YouTube as well, and on Instagram, it's More Elites, and Facebook, it's More Elites Farms. And can people find your product in the United States or is it right now? Is it just located in, in Ontario? At the moment, uh, it's all just in Ontario that okay. people can get products. Now, are are yeah. you planning maybe in the future to try to branch out to the United States? Yes. Um, uh, I, I am ambitious and <laughs> I do hope to to grow our brand and, and, not, like, and, and not just like the way we farm, but like I want to... Be an example to farms. Like you'll, they'll, they'll probably be people that learn from our material or learn yes. from the move regenerative agriculture. And it's all, all of, I'm, I put all the information out there for free. Like I'm sure there'll be people that pick up stuff like that. So always talk to your farmer and ask how they raise it. But yes, I do have the ambition to want to grow across Canada and into the States as well, especially with the cow calf milk. That's a very unique product that is yes. very underrepresented, and that we are really very much on the leading edge and the cutting edge of, of this type of management. So that's something that like, yes, we, we also have regenerative meats and stuff like that, that we're selling, but that's pretty popular now. Like you can find basically any state or any province, any city that you live in, Yes, you will be able to find local farmers that are producing food in a regenerative way with rotational grazing. Right. But the, what we're doing with the cow calf contact and producing the cow cow with calf milk, that is a very unique product. Yes, and something that I really desperately want to bring across North America. That's awesome, you know. And no one, I I think that you know, um, if everyone hears this and and is in the in the dairy industry, you never know in the future what might happen. But I could definitely see you coming into the United States. This is a product I think millions of people would would love, you know, because we are, you know, we have a society now that is gearing towards healthy living and healthy eating and and trying to maintain a healthy mindset. So I, I think this is definitely something that people in the United States would be interested in. And it's always great to know the information information that you provide because it helps us make the right choices also. That's right. Yeah. There's a definitely an increase in, in people, consumer interest in how their food is produced and people want to know and how it's produced. And, they're, um, and thankfully there's, there's a number of them that are willing to pay to make sure that that kind of food is produced in a, in a responsible way or in a way that they deem ideal so yeah like, there's definitely improving and increasing and there's also an increase in 
the the trend towards having like a forward facing company. So it's not just you hiding behind your brand. Yes. It's an actual person, the farmer, like myself, talking to people. And like the mm -hmm. nice thing about like like videos and social media and podcasts and emails, like I can build a relationship at scale. I can meet yes. through through the internet. I can meet all sorts of people and I can show them what we're doing on our farm. So yeah. like it's, it's it's scalable to build that those relationships. Now tell everybody your your website address so they know where to go to. Our website is www.moraleats.com. So M-O-R-A-L-E-A-T-S.com. That's where you can find, I post all of our podcasts. You'll find Stacy's podcast links there as well. And uh, also just some background information and, and the reasoning behind what we're trying to do with animal welfare and regenerative agriculture. And also like what we're actually doing on our farm and how we're improving welfare and, and pushing the envelope for, for agriculture as a whole. Yeah. And a lot of the education stuff there, I also have some blog posts on there. So a lot of information you can find on that website as well as the links to our social medias. That's awesome. This has been great. Thank you so much, Sandra, for coming on the show. This has been amazing. I love hearing you, um, you know, discuss about the dairy industry. And, and I learned so much from our conversations. And I'm sure all the millions of people out there listening learn a lot also. But thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing about, you know, all the different things that we really need to take into account, you know, and understand how the animals are raised and how they actually integrate with their mothers and and the importance of, of having raw milk and having clean milk and and knowing what type of milk to, to buy. So this has been really great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, you're very welcome. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.